Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day and all its many, many blessings. Father, be with all of the sick and afflicted. Father, be with those who have lost loved ones, especially with John McCain family. Be with them, give them comfort. Father, go with us as we go through our lesson this morning. Let each and every one of us listen carefully and, and learn more about your word. Father, forgive us of all of our unforgiven sins. For this is the prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Good morning and welcome. This morning we'll be studying from 2 Timothy. We'll be finishing up chapter 2 and then beginning our study of chapter 3. It's interesting to see uh, the direction that the Apostle Paul gives Timothy and us. Of course, all of this is applicable to us today. But we see the human side of the Apostle Paul as he instructs Timothy and he faces his own uh, martyrdom uh, probably within a few months of the writing of this second letter to Timothy. And he tells Timothy and he tells us that what we teach matters. He talks about doctrine. But he also tells us in this lesson, he tells us how we teach other people matters as well. When I was a, in the fifth grade, my dad was he was a preacher for 60-some years in the church, and he was also a school teacher and principal. He was principal of the school I went to in the fifth grade, and we had a substitute teacher there once, and uh, uh, I'm told him in the presence of that substitute teacher about a kid that had done something wrong. And that substitute teacher looked at him and kind of snarled up and said, He's kind of a tattletale, litany he, talking about me? And my dad took up for me and said, no, he's just got a real strong sense of justice. Well, I think as Christians, we probably are to have a strong sense of justice. But sometimes that sense of justice can motivate us with a spirit of righteous indignation to the point that when we're teaching other people, Maybe we say things in the wrong way and get a little too shrill sometimes. And that's what our lesson is going to be talking about today. Paul gives some instruction on not only what we teach, but how we teach it. Let's go back to uh, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Uh, last time we covered verses 17 through 21. Let's review those very briefly. In verse 17, he says, says their word, who is he talking about? He's talking about those people that, that strive about words, that subvert, try to gain personal following of hearers and speak, as he puts it in those verses, their vain babblings. And he says they will be like a, a canker. Uh, uh, your translation may say a gangrene or a cancer, something or someone that can poison the entire body or poison the entire church. What is the poison? Well, Christ said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, it's the doctrine of men. And he said, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he gives example of these types of men uh, in the verses here. And he's talking about... Uh, uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and they're also mentioned by Paul, and, uh, or at least Hymenaeus is in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20. Verse 18, Paul now gives an example of the false teaching that Hymenaeus and Philetus were guilty of, saying that the resurrection is already passed. And we spent a lot of time in this time uh, class talking about baptism, what it is, what is it, it isn't, how that it parallels the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read from Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. I think we have a pretty clear picture of that. But evidently, Hymenaeus and Philetus uh, were saying that the resurrection that the, the prophets talked about and that Christ talked about and the apostles talked about was being raised from the watery grave of baptism. Uh, 
John said in chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. And we remember Paul before Felix in Acts chapter 24 re- referenced the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So that tells us that the resurrection that Christ talked about, that the apostles talked about, couldn't be the resurrection from baptism because all are going to be resurrected in that day, both the just and the unjust. So the bottom line from that verse is what we teach does matter. Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching something that was wrong and it had to be rooted out within the church. Otherwise, they would have been doing something other than what God wanted them to do. Paul goes on in verse 19, it, no doubt that, that it would have been easy for the New Testament church to be discouraged with the persecutions that were going on and also with uh, false teaching within the church, the Judaizing teachers, some of the things we've talked about in here in the past years. It would have been easy to get discouraged, but Paul makes a very positive statement in verse 19. He says, the foundation of God standeth sure, and we got to remember that today. We see all the things that are going on, some of the ugly things in society, the ugly things going on in their schools. God's truth doesn't change. We've got to remember that. That's basically what Paul is saying here. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, referencing his church. He goes on in verse 19 there, and he says... Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So he's saying that being saying that we're a Christian is not enough. We've got to depart from unrighteousness. We've got to practice what we preach. We look back to Second Corinthians five ten says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be Bad. So we are accountable for what we do. Can't just be a Christian in name only. Can't just talk a good game. We've actually got to play a good game. We've got to actually be Christians in action as well. He goes on in verse 20 and 21, and we were finishing up on that last time, and he's talking about vessels, you and me. Something that is useful or carrying water, or carrying food, or something, something that is useful. We as Christians want to be vessels that are useful to God the Father. We want to be productive. And he gives vessels of honor, and there are different kinds of vessels made of different things, silver and gold, wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. There's always going to be strong and weak solid and shaky, brave and cowardly within the church. And we shouldn't be surprised and shouldn't be discouraged by that. But one of the things that discourages me, and I'm sure you more than anything else, is to see weakness within the church itself. Because the church is supposed to be strong and everybody in it is supposed to be perfect, right? Well, none of us are perfect. We all uh, sin and come short of the glory of God. And we gave the analogy in closing last time about, you know, in the ark was Ham. And we know that in, in, in the womb of Rebekah was Esau. And we know that Pharaoh did some things that actually helped the people of God ultimately. God uses evil men uh, to do good things sometimes. We look at the story of Judas Iscariot himself and that he was used for the betterment of mankind and, and the crucifixion of Christ. He wasn't made to do that. He had free will to choose, but uh, God uses evil men sometimes for his pur- purpose. Finally, verse 21, A man therefore purges himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified in meat for the master's rule, prepared for every good work. So if a man therefore purges himself, So man does have a choice and can move from being a vessel of dishonor to one of honor. This is in direct contrast of the view once saved, always saved. It tells me that as a Christian, I can be baptized, I can move into a saved state, 
But if I allow my life to deteriorate, if I don't walk the walk as well as talking the talk, referencing back to verse 19, then I can become a vessel of dishonor. But I still have hope of being saved if I'll put away those things, purge myself from these things of the earth so that I again become a, a vessel of honor useful to the cause of Christ. And I think verse 26, we'll get to it in a minute, confirms that where he says that they may recover themselves from the snare of the devil. Now verse 22 through 25 we're going to study today lists some of the things that we should avoid and how we should teach and purge ourselves and avoid the snare of the devil. Let's read verse 22 through 26 for the first part of our lesson today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Okay, going back to verse 22, we need to keep in mind as he's writing this, it's for all of our admonition and direction, certainly. And he includes some commands in here that are applicable to us as well. But some of this has a personal tone toward his son in the faith, Timothy. We know that Timothy was a relatively young man in his early to mid-30s at the time of this writing. And Paul knew that the, there were many temptations facing young people at that time, as there are today. He knew that it was much easier to be caught up in the flavors of the day when you're younger, in the sins of the flesh, than later in life when we get white hair or no hair like some of us in here today. A hot temper, being impetuous, might also be something that Paul has in mind here in addressing Timothy and the younger folk. Flee those youthful lusts. Don't be caught up in the flavor and day. Don't let the passions of the flesh drive you to do things that are wrong and thereby lose your efficacy to spread the gospel of Christ because you're compromising your example as a Christian. Follow after righteousness, the opposite of following fleshly lusts and desires, he says here. And then he gives this list of things that we should strive for instead of the pleasures of the flesh. First of all, he lists faith. Instead of seeking pleasure, look instead for better understanding and a stronger faith. Love. A true love of God, church, family, spouse. Not love of the fleshly gratifications that so many of the world seek after today. Peace. Youthful lust won't make us happy for very long. The older we get, the more we see that. All the tapestries of life we see that are new and shiny, they rust and quit running, they fade away, and it doesn't take very long. We understand that as we get older. True peace is found in true truth and the practice of it. You know, one thing about the Apostle Paul, he's very consistent. We look back to an almost identical message in the first letter that he wrote to Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 12 sounds so similar to this verse 22. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Basically the same message, isn't it? As we get older, we have more experience. Hopefully we have more knowledge of God's Word and our foundation and spiritual roots run a little deeper than when you're younger. 
you also see from a better perspective the brevity of some of the things that the world say uh, are important. We see that those things are indeed fleeting. That's the message of what Paul is saying here in verse 22 and also in 1 Timothy 4.12. Okay, verse 23. Kind of the other side of the coin. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And he's already talked about here, and also a little bit in the first letter to Timothy, about people that like to throw dirt up in the air, that like to raise a lot of questions, and that that like to stir the pot, so to speak. He says, don't be like that, and deal with people like that in a wise way. Foolish and ignorant questions refuse. Questions and arguments about things that really don't matter. Things that we can't know for sure or that are designed to either create friction or to make the questioner look smarter. However, there, there is no problem on the other side of the coin with asking a legitimate question and having a discussion about things. I think that can be a very healthy thing. But when we become very dogmatic about an issue that maybe we can't know for sure, then we compromise our credibility on other things, I think. He says we need to keep focused on God's Word and not, as he says in verse 14, strive about words. And in verse 16, uh, <clears throat> that we are to shun profane and vain babblings. Let's get focused on the things that are important. The credibility of Jesus Christ, the commissioning of the apostles and their credibility as being inspired of the Holy Spirit, the plan of salvation about what which there is no question, worship God in spirit and in truth, following the New Testament example as far as we can possibly ascertain the New Testament church did it, those type of things. Let's get focused on that and not strive about words as he says here. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. The Lord's servant must not strive. He must not create undue controversy. We do, however, need to stick up for the truth at all times. Jude says in Jude 3, I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Now, we know that most of the book of Jude is about contending for the faith as opposed to those that false, uh, taught false doctrine. We have an obligation to stick up for what's right and separate the wheat from the chaff and not allow these incidentals uh, to create friction within the church, within the brotherhood, uh, to its detriment. So Paul now also, after saying that, he, he starts giving a little bit of direction here in verse 24 of how we should teach and study. And he gives the direction here that we should be gentle, forbearing, apt to teach, which means being prepared in the Scriptures that you know something, that you've studied your Bible, and that you're not just speaking from the heart or taking one verse out of context and trying to a teach a lesson on it, but you're taking everything uh, as a whole apt to teach. I can remember as a little boy going to some of the tent men meeting uh, revivals that we had around in Kentucky and Virginia and different places in Tennessee, and some of the times those meetings would go for 10 days, I can remember, and sometimes it seems like the sermon went almost that long as well, and uh, there were some preachers that I can remember that came, and man, they could, they could flat spit it out, and they would get really, really rough. Sometimes we need chastisement. But I think Paul is talking a little bit differently here. He's already talked about doctrine. There's no question that Paul says we have to get the doctrine right. We have to teach what's right and pay attention to what's being taught. But we also have to do our teaching, he says, in a gentle, kind, and forbearing way. 
I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from Lipscomb, David Lipscomb. And remember that his quotes were written about a hundred years ago. But boy, some of the things that I'm going to quote to you today sound so applicable to what we see in society. Lipscomb said in conjunction with verse 24, this is what the servant of the Lord should really aim at being, the teacher rather than the controversialist, rather the patient endurer of wrong than the foremaner of dissensions and wordy strifes. In other words, it's not about making ourselves look good or look informed. It's about the Word. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ and getting that message over in the kindest and most loving way that we can. And Paul, in verse 25, goes on talking about how we do that. And he says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. In meekness instructing. Your translation may say correcting them. So truth does matter. It doesn't say you just let everything slide for the sake of harmony. We've got to get it right in the eyes of God, but we do so in meekness. False doctrines to be corrected, but it must be corrected in the right way. Meekly, not with an emotional sense of righteous indignation. Quote Lipscomb again, conjunction with verse 25. Boy, this really sounds applicable. He says, we should treat every man's religious feeling and practices with the respect and courtesy we would like to have shown us. This does not involve any compromise of truth or righteousness or any winking at errors. Well, we see a lot of political correctness today in in allowing everybody to do their own thing. It's hard to believe that David Lipscomb wrote this about 100 years ago and it's so applicable to us today. We need to show respect and dignity, not bidding them Godspeed in the things that they are teaching that are wrong. We've got to correct those things, but we do so with the proper attitude and meekness. He uses a phrase there in verse 25, too, that's kind of interesting. Those that uh, oppose themselves, and I think the thought there is, Whenever we oppose God, we're just doing it to our own detriment. We're opposing ourselves because we're not going to come out on top of God. And the goal is repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's not, the goal is not being right so that we're right and they're wrong. The goal is bringing them to the truth, that they understand the truth and that they act on the truth. So the instruction isn't to compromise the truth, but help the false teacher to acknowledge and accept the truth. Now with all that said, it does seem to me that there is a point at which a change in teaching strategy must take place. If you've got your New Testament or your book that are handy, turn over about two pages to Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. And I think he may actually be talking about withdrawal from fellowship. If you get to the point that someone continues to teach false doctrine within the church and you've gone to them and worked with them, there may be a point at which you have to cut cut ties and and, uh, fellowship with that person. Very similar wording here, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies. This was kind of a Jewish thing, the genealogies, and, and contentions and striving about the law for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So if you keep going back to that person and they still are spreading dissension within the church and teaching things that are clearly in conflict with God, God's Word, I'm not talking about incidentals that we can't know for sure. I'm talking about things like the plan of salvation and the necessity of baptism. Issues like the resurrection, I, I think, would fall in that category as well. Then you may get to the point that you have to uh, withdraw, withdraw fellowship. Just one point of clarification on that word heretic. Johnson, one of the other commentaries that I used for 1st and 2nd Timothy, says heretic means a divider. Anyone who preaches doctrines which would divide the household of faith is a heretic. 
and reject seems to point to withdrawal uh, of fellowship here as well. Okay. Verse 26, going back to uh, chapter 2 of, of 2 Timothy, is kind of our goal of why we are teaching the truth, making sure it's the truth, doing it in the right way, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Luke chapter 15, verse 17, talking about the prodigal son. We know the prodigal son that, that went and he asked for his inheritance and got his inheritance. Father gave it to him, even though he probably didn't want to, but he, he gave it to him. And he went into a foreign land and he lived up his inheritance with harlots and spent everything he had and partied all the time, I guess. And finally, he's sitting out there in the hog lot feeding the hogs. And it says there in verse 17 that he came to himself. He saw the truth of his situation. And I think that's what verse 26 is saying here, that they may recover themselves, that they see the truth of their situation, what they're doing to their personal lives and what they're doing to the church with the dissension uh, that they're sh showing. False teachers and those that would unrighteously disrupt the church need to come to the truth to avoid being lost to, as Paul says here, to the snare of the devil. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 how we must approach truth and obedience. There he says, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth himself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And I think that's just a kind of lengthy way of saying what we said earlier. It's not about us. It's not about projecting our ability or, or projecting our knowledge. It's about projecting Jesus Christ and the knowledge of his truth and bringing those to repentance that they may recover themselves and, as Paul says, avoid the snare of the devil. So the summary of thought here is we've got to seek, know, and fight for the truth. And we've got to do it in the right way in all means. Okay, that finishes up chapter 2. Anybody got any comment about chapter 2 before we go into chapter 3? If not, let's read the first uh, five verses, Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also... That in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Well, we see that today, don't we? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. I think that's talking about homosexuality. Truce breakers. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Boy, we see a lot of that today. A lot of people hate the Christians today. It seems like more and more. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That kind of ties back to what Paul talked about, love of the flesh. Having a form of godliness, now this is important, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So all of those honorary folk that he's talking about there in verses 2 through 4 have a form of godliness. They may be religious people. It may be something other than Christianity or it may even be within Christianity. Not even be within the church. We need to be careful of those things. We're going to talk a lot more about those things in two, two weeks. Let's go back to, to verse 1 and make sure we know what perilous times we're talking about here. He talks about in the last days, 
or your translation may say the last ages of the world. We are, in fact, in the last age. We are in the last dispensation, the Christian dispensation. Well, now, how do I know that? Well, the word for last days here is the same word that's used in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And this was Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And he's quoting from the prophet Joel about Pentecost and the uh, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would happen on the onset of Christ's church. And he says, But this is that which was pr- spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, same word used here in the Greek, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This describing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And if that's not enough, we look back to Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, and even the Hebrew writer where they talk about the last days, and it's talking about those days of when the Messiah has come, and in some places kind of points toward the establishment of the church. So if on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that first gospel sermon, if that was the last days, then 2018 is part of those last days, too. We are in the last days, the final Christian dispensation. And he talks about perilous, grievous times shall come. He's saying there are going to be hard times for Christians. And we look back to the destruction of Jerusalem some years later after that, and we look at the bad things Nero did probably a few months after the writing of this letter he uh, killed Paul and all the other Christians that were persecuted. And we think about the difficulties that we face in the 21st century, and as we've alluded to before, all the names that the Christians are called, and the prophecy of Isaiah saying the time's going to come when good will be called evil, and evil will be called good, and folks, we are in those times. We are in those perilous and grievous times, even today, being in this last dispensation. Again, verses 2 through 8 describe the sinful people and actions that would plague and continue to plague the Lord's church. We'll talk about them in two weeks. Let me conclude by saying this. We must know the truth. Paul makes that clear. We must live the truth and defend the truth. He also makes that clear. And we are all obligated to spread the truth. Just as Paul told Timothy, his son in the faith, don't be drawn away by the world. Keep your focus. Keep your humility and meekness. And live as a Christian. We'll pick up with that two weeks from today.
Good morning. Again, I really hate breaking up all that good fellowship time, but it's time to begin our services of Lord's Church here at Calvert City. We're so thankful that you are here with us this morning. If you are visiting with us, please take the time to fill out a card located in the pew in front of you. And then if you would, at the appropriate time, which is when the collection plate is passed around, if you would just please put that blue card in the collection plate then. In our uh, hospital um, announcements, uh, Ms. Sneldebeth is in Marshall County Hospital, room 107, and may be moving to rehab. Today is the last Sunday of the month, so that means that we will have a service at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and there is no 6 p.m. service. You can show up, but chances are no one will be here. So, uh, 1 o'clock service this afternoon because it is the last Sunday. Uh, for more detailed announcements, please see the little half blue sheet that was located in the foyer. And at this time, I will conclude the announcements. We will now have our scripture reading. And our scripture reading this morning is going to come from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. If you're willing and able, would you please stand as we read from God's holy word. The Bible reads, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King... The Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sins atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. You may be seated. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Keep silence. Keep silence. Keep silence. Be On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They hem their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to Join. Here all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus lovely name shall victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great I am and bow before the great I am. While everlasting ages roll, eternal love shall feast their soul and scenes of bliss forever new. Rise in succession to their view, rise in succession to their view. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God 
I adore Who like me thy praise should sing O oh, almighty King Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts on high Following this next song, we'll have a prayer. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to Of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Let's pray together to our Father. Holy Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you together now to offer simple prayer of praise to you. Father, as we participate together as one church, we ask that you will help us to put aside our personal desires and simply focus our innermost spirits on you, God. Father, we are humbled to know that you are the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-present being that created us so that we could be the objects of your love, not only here today, but for eternity. Father, we're so incredibly grateful that even though you knew how we would be before you created us, you loved us enough to follow through. Father, we're so thankful to have your written word and so thankful to know how to offer worship to you. We're thankful to have faithful servants of yours to bring us a clearer understanding of your word so that we may be continually growing closer to you. Father, as we sing together, you'll hear us plucking the strings of the very instrument that you created so that you will hear an expression of our love to you. And Father, in just a few moments, we'll begin turning our minds to Jesus and the cross. But before we do, we want to say thank you for the honor and the privilege that you've given us to remember our Savior and King. Thank you for the memorial feast that we get to participate in together. 
We're here today, Lord, to say thank You for loving us. Thank You for Your continued patience and Your forgiveness to us. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who puts the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. The one seen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. You would turn your Bibles to John chapter 18. We'll be reading some passages there from that to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. John chapter 18, I'll first be reading verses 12 through 14, then verse 28, and then verses 33 through 38. Beginning in verse 12. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Cephas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Cephas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? Now dropping to verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born... And for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. 
These three passages tell of the different trials of Jesus. First, before Annas, a high priest and the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Second, before Caiaphas, the high priest that particular year. And third, before Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Judea at that time. Although Pilate found Jesus not guilty, he sentenced him to die on the cross just to appease the Jews. Jesus also acknowledges in that last passage that he is our spiritual king and the reason why he came to earth. One of the principal reasons why we weekly partake of the Lord's Supper is to do so in honor and in memory of the sacrifice that he made on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. As we do that this morning, let us all remove the cares of the world from our worship, uh, from our minds so that we can worship. Uh, let's reflect upon and be thankful for all of the good that God has done for us. And let's commit ourselves to seek His will all the remaining days of our lives. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our gracious Father, we have come from different walks of life, different homes. We're thankful, Father, that we can gather together here as one. We're thankful for the reading of your word just a moment ago that tells us of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are so very thankful that He gave Himself for our sins, for my sins. As we think of Him and His sacrifice, and as we take this bread which represents His body, may we think of You giving Your Son. May we think of Him giving Himself. May we have gratitude in our hearts and joy because of what has come to us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue our prayer of thanks and remembrance, Father, we pray that as we take of this emblem that represents the blood that was spilled for us, that we do go back to the cross and, and have the recollection of what has taken place for us. Father, as we do so, we pray that our minds are cleared of the worldly things and, and focus solely on you. And in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Would you bow with me as we give thanks? Father, we thank you for the privilege to have partaken of the Supper of the Lord today. Indeed, our hearts are filled with thankfulness and joy for what you have done for us. And now as we think of the material blessings that you have given us, and think of the things that can should and will be done with what we offer back to you. We pray that our hearts are open and liberal in giving back to you a portion of what you have given to us. And once again, in light of all these things, we're so very thankful for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand as we sing, please. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore Thee, casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who was and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, holy, merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. I would encourage you to turn again to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. As we think about something that is very much a part of our lives, as obviously you have thought about today, and that is the worship of our Lord. I'm wondering in what different ways have you worshipped? And I'm speaking of in the assemblies of which you've been a part. Many of us have grown up within this congregation. And for the most part, this is where we learned to worship. This is where we continue to worship. And our, experiences has, our experience has been very similar Others grew up in other congregations, maybe a different part of the country. Maybe the, the congregation in which you grew up was larger than the assembly that we have this morning. Maybe the assembly that in which you grew up and participated in worship which was much smaller than we have present this morning. In my personal remembrance, I can remember being an RA, or that is a resident assistant at Freed Hardeman. And twice that I can recall, we went to Land Between the Lakes long before I knew Calvert City or even heard of Calvert City. We spent Friday night and Saturday, all day Saturday at 
one of the sinners there, the retreat center. And on Sunday morning, knowing that we had potential preachers, preachers, teachers, we were able to conduct a worship service very similar to what we have. But the atmosphere was much different. In some ways, people were affected more deeply by it. In the wintertime, it was cold. In the summertime, it was rather warm. But we could look out our windows and see the works of nature and God's creation. Some of you have been at West Kentucky Youth Camp on a Sunday morning, and you have seen what a worship service out of this particular building is like. And no doubt it made an impression on you and it helped you in many ways. Hopefully it did not distract. In 1988, I went to uh, Manila, the Philippines. Participated with the saints on Sunday morning, halfway around the world. And it was an enjoyable and appreciative experience to sing together, to pray together. To partake of the Lord's Supper with my brothers and sisters that I had not met before. To listen to, and in my case, to preach a lesson from God's Word. I'm thankful that we have that opportunity, and I'm thankful that a few years ago I was in Benin, Africa, which you probably heard about Wednesday night, West Africa. An unusual experience in that this, as I was waking up on Sunday morning, I began to hear noises outside the place in which we were staying. And as we walked out, we could see people. Some were walking, some had ridden what we would call motorbikes or motorcycles, some had ridden bicycles. And they were gathered together, gathering together, and there were ladies among them dressed in very colorful and bright dresses, and we met under a tent. Hundreds of people that I had never met, that I knew only most of them by reputation and knowing where they were from. But at the moment we began to worship God, our voices blended, our spirits blended, we were of one mind and one purpose as we sang together and as we partook of the Lord's Supper, listened to His Word, gave of our means, prayed together. Just a few weeks ago, we traveled from here to Mankato, Minnesota, in a building similar to ours, but in the, another way very much dissimilar from ours. We gathered together with 40 or so from that area, but more than 60 from our two congregations, that is Mount Juliet and Calvert. And it also was different in some ways, but in other ways it was very similar. We sang praises together, just our voices. We heard a lesson from God's Word. We worshiped in prayer and in partaking of the Lord's Supper. And yes, we gave a portion of our living back to God. All of these are very different settings. Probably the one besides Africa that stands out in my mind is in 1995. Some of you remember Stan Shelton. Stan Shelton was getting married. And he got married on uh, Christmas Eve. And it was in West Virginia, cold West Virginia. And while we were there, we went up on a mountain to a cabin, and, and we went to someone else's cabin, and Laura and I and Drew were in a, a car going up there, and I don't know if your life actually does flash before your eyes as you see something that is about to happen that would take you from this earth. But we began sliding down, and behind us we couldn't see very much besides the mountain. We didn't, of course. 
But we did go up on the mountain and we worshiped there together with a small group of God's people. One of the most memorable times that I can recall. Again, very different in some ways, but very similar in others. The similar the similarity is, number one, I was there and I participated. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But I wonder as you're going through your, your library of memories this morning, do you recall those times, their similarities and their differences? And do you think of, as you come together today, or is it important to you that you have prepared yourself to worship God? Coincidentally, before I came to, to worship this morning, I received an email from someone that visits us from time to time. And they were planning their time to be with us in October, actually in September, beginning in October. But they were going to arrive here on the last Sunday of September. And so they knew that our worship services would be as it is today on the last Sunday, where we would meet together on 1 o'clock. So they asked if I had a recommendation of a sister congregation with which they could visit. And I did. But I wonder how many people do that. Would you think of where you're going to be in a month from now? And if you were not going to be in a familiar place, would you already have a place to worship? Would you already have plans to attend with the, the brethren, the brothers and sisters, if you will, in a particular location? Would you meet together with them? Would you plan to worship with them? These are thought-provoking questions. It reminds me, as it often does, of things that are in my experiences. It's so very easy to be become routine. And so every once in a while, it's good to remember what you're here for and what you're doing. So when the phrase is said this morning, when I worship... I could have easily put an ellipsis, that is, the three dots there, and said, when I worship what? Recall, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah. I'm not going to read the, the chapter again or the verses again. But recall, if you will, Isaiah is in the temple, apparently. He's in the courtyard of the temple. He is a, a prophet of God. And the Bible tells us that as Isaiah was there, he saw the Lord. And he saw what appeared to be a, a train that is like a, the dress of a, a bride. She has a train. This was the, the robe of God. No man has seen God at any time and lived, we're told from the Bible. Therefore, what Isaiah saw is what we call a theophany. They possibly involved Jesus Christ himself, according to John chapter 12, verses 40, 41, and 42. Because as he quotes the, the words of Isaiah from later on in the chapter, he says, he said this because he saw him and he saw his glory. He foresaw him, he saw his glory. So it's possible Jesus was the one that John saw in this particular vision. As you go a little further down, you see that there is something else very impressive that it seemed to, to fill the whole house with smoke. And he heard the words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah was there in a place that was designated a place of worship. I want you to think of the fact that as we worship God together, when I worship, first of all, well, I stand and we stand in a long line of worshipers. Worshipers. One of the interesting things that I notice when I read or watch television or anything else, that almost every society has some form of worship built within it may be just as simple as just simply bowing down and praying in some way to a God, little g. It may be acknowledging a great spirit, as it's been done in, in Native American history. 
But it seems a universal need to worship something or someone. So many of the things that, that or many of the worshipers that come, have come before us have been inadequate. If you recall in Joshua chapter 24, long before, or just a few verses before Joshua said, As for me and my house, we will serve thee, Lord. Back in those first few verses, three and four especially, he says, Our forefathers lived on the other side of the flood. They lived in Egypt, or, or lived on the other side of the flood as well. And he said, They served other gods. Whether you know it or not, Abraham was a pagan, apparently, before he became a follower of God. But he learned to wor worship God in spirit and truth. And so this morning, as we think of our worship, we, we join hands and, and thoughts in a way with, with Abraham. He's called the friend of God in the text of the Bible. Abraham is, was one who was once called Abram, but... He was later called Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. And so we have Abraham told in, in Genesis chapter 22 to go and offer his son Isaac. The book of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham believed that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. But he went in order to worship God. And he says in chapter 22 and verse 5, the boy and I will go over there and worship and return to you, telling his servant. There was an intention, there was a thought, and there was preparation for them to go and worship. Moses, in the book of Exodus, chapter, chapter 20 and following, gave the people of, of Israel an outline of the tabernacle and its worship and, and all its laws. We know the ten words or the ten commandments. They were a part of the pattern of worshiping God. We recall the words of, of God in, in Hebrews chapter 3, where, or chapter 8 and verse 3, do all things according to the pattern. We recall in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, that Nadab and Abihu, priests, approached God. But they came with strange fire, King James Version, unauthorized fire, the New International Version. Wherever this fire came from, it didn't come from the altar of God as, as was commanded. And so not only was their worship rejected, but they themselves were rejected. And in an, in an instantaneous moment, they were consumed by the fire of God. Telling us that when we tread in the area of worship, we should be heedful of God. And so we stand in a long line of worship. A lady says to Jesus, Our fathers say that we ought to worship in this mountain, but you worship in Jerusalem. And she was wondering, since he was a prophet, would he tell her? I want you to turn with me to John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, and read what Jesus says to her. Because it's something that, even though Jesus had not been crucified yet. It's something that Jesus was anticipating. And so what he says, and she says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus says in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I appreciate Gail singing the songs of worship this morning. 
our minds evidently didn't blend. I was hoping he would select a oh, worship the king. But sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. That's fine. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it strings from the hills, it descends to the plains, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Adequately or inadequately, you've approached God today. Have you approached Him in spirit and in truth? Are the things that you have prepared to do today in a matter of the Spirit, are you meeting God on a spiritual plane? You may wear certain clothing to, to worship. You may, you may drive a, a certain automobile, but it is not so much important as where your mind is. Yes, we could talk about matters of modesty. And yes, we could talk about other things. But we do know that our mind should be in the Spirit of God. And we do know that God also wants us to, to be mindful of truth when we worship. I've spoken this morning about singing. We've been known as people of God for many years, and, and oftentimes the, the discussion comes about of worship with or without the instruments. We could say, uh, we, could, we could use a very long set of arguments about what we do. But very simply said, Bible, the Bible has, has told us that we're to sing to God. Singing and making melody in our hearts one to another. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Colossians chapter 3 and verse, six, or verse 16. The worship of God is very important to us. Songs like, O oh, Worship the King, are efforts from the past to bring us in our minds into the presence of God. Here I am to worship, which we sang just a few moments ago, is another attempt, a more modern attempt, to, to bring us into the presence of God. And both of them bring us into the presence of God. But only we can do that in our minds. We know that the, the early church prayed. They continued steadfast. They continued in prayer. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, 46 and 47. We know that Paul and others preached to them as he did in Acts chapter 20. We know that the Lord's Supper was a part of their assembly from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In fact, Paul was correcting them that when you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, as it truly is. We give of our means. Paul said for the early church in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, to lay by in store or to have laid by in store in order that they might give on the first day of the week as God has prospered them. But secondly, I want you to look at something else. We worship the Lord of the universe. The Lord of the universe. Our society is a very visual society. We have televisions within our home that give high-definition images. so real that it seems in some cases you're almost there. We are so in tune with our modern culture that, that we sometimes depend on images to bring out what we feel. 
And yet we can do that simply by following the commands of God. But we worship the Lord of the universe. Paul was in Athens. Athens was a very religious city. In Acts chapter 17, if you're reading the King James Version, you know that Paul says, I perceive, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things, you are very superstitious. But Paul seemed to be saying not so much a slam to them, as that sounds like to us, as to say you're very religious. Some commentators said there were, say there, were, there was an altar on every corner. And so, so Paul said, I found an altar to the unknown God. In other words, they in, in their, their altar making had designs on not leaving anyone out, and so they had an altar to the unknown God. And so Paul takes the opportunity, the one that you worship without knowledge or ignorantly, as we sometimes say, him I declare to you. And Paul began to have a description of, of God as, as the God that temples cannot contain, even though there was a temple in the Old Testament. It wasn't to contain God. It was to help man focus on God. And eventually that centered place of worship, as the lady said, we worship in this mountain, you worship in Jerusalem. Which one's right? Jesus said the time's coming when those who truly worship Him will do so in spirit and in truth. And so whether we're here in this assembly this morning or we've been called away by our jobs or our vacations and we assemble with someone else, Somewhere else, we're worshiping God. It's comforting together to understand that, that as we assemble this morning, that there are those on, in the United States who are assembling almost at the same time as we are, some just a little bit early, sometimes, sometimes a little bit late. That on the other side of the world, when the first day of the week comes forward, maybe even in some cases 12 hours before us, they are worshiping together and precede our worship a little bit, but still on the same day, we're joined in worship to God, the Lord of the universe. I remember when I was preaching in Atwood, a little boy was fascinated with He-Man. Loved He-Man. He would come out with a He-Man doll as, as he left the assembly. And as I recall, He-Man was, was uh, associated with the masters of the universe. That's a fantasy. We know that. We know that He-Man was not himself a master of the universe, nor did he associate with the masters of the universe. There is one creator of this universe. What's amazing to me is as, ten as Isaiah was in the temple, he was given a vision of God. He was able to see not only something that appeared to be God Himself, something that was given as a re representation of God, apparently Jesus, but He saw the robe. He saw the smoke. He saw what are called seraphs, which we would equate with at least created beings or, or possibly angels. A similar sighting is in Ezekiel chapters 1 through 3 and also Revelation chapters 4, 5, and 6 where the created creatures of God bow down to worship. It's interesting that in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah was about to be given a commission to go and preach to people who didn't want to listen to him. In fact, that's the way Jesus quotes it in John chapter 12. It's interesting that in Revelation chapter 4, 5, Revelation chapter 4, 5, and 6, when John is given a vision of God, he is about to go and, and proclaim this vision and proclaim it to those who need it because they're in the midst of the people who don't want to hear about God. Because we worship the God of the universe, the Lord of the universe. Number three, I need to remember that when I worship, I offer something. I offer something. Modern day, 
Even though I am a preacher, I am not the sole performer of this worship service. Even though Gail is an interesting person and he's a talented man, he is not the center of this worship service. Any of the men who, who aided and assisted in, in, partaking, uh, in you partaking the Lord's Supper are not the performers in the worship service for you to watch and applaud, disprove, thumbs up or thumbs down. You are the participant. God is the audience. There's always been a temptation to make it man-centered. When I think of worship, I think of the, the primary meaning of the word, which is to bow down. Or to kiss toward, or to bow down in some, way, in some cases, kiss the ground toward someone else. In this case, God. I don't want you to bow down to me, just as John didn't want anyone to bow, or the angel didn't want John to bow down to him. Peter didn't want in, the, uh, the house or Cornelius to bow down to him in Acts chapter 10. Worship is about what I do for God. Before God. It's interesting that in, Acts, uh, in Exodus chapters 20 and following, not only are the, the uh, commands given to the people of Israel, but specific things about offerings are given. Regulations and patterns. God wanted them to understand that when you come to worship God, you give something. You offer something. And so we have burnt offerings and we have free will offerings. We have various other offerings. And I think it's also interesting when you read the, the uh, offerings of God in, in the book of Exodus and also as it's recalled in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Leviticus especially about the offerings. You'll find that when someone couldn't afford a certain type of offering, they were allowed to give something else. And if you're a diligent student of Scripture, you know that when, when Jesus was brought in Luke chapter 2 to, to the temple by His parents, that the offering that they brought was not the normal offering of a person of what we would call middle class or upper class. It was the offering of peasants. And so no matter where you, where you are in, in the, the strata of society or the layers of society, you can come together with God and you can worship God with your heart and your soul and your voice. And God will accept it if you do it also in truth, as God wants you to do. Emotions are very important. But emotions do not dictate what I do in worship. It may bring about a better feeling. It may bring about a little bit of harmony with, with my emotions and my heart. But emotions are products. They are not to be generators of feelings themselves. And so as I think about that, we offer something. When I come to God and I sing to God, I think it, it's very unequal if I come to worship God and a song is announced and I refuse to sing. Just as surely as if I am in an assembly and someone says, let's pray. And I refuse to bow my head and I refuse to or I refuse to even meet Him in the place in which He is praying, that is, on the spirit level where He is praying. I refuse to do that. Or just as surely as if on a Sunday morning as I, I refuse to sing, I just as soon refuse to, as the, the Lord's Supper has passed by me, and, and I'm a follower of God, and I've obeyed His Word, and I've obeyed the Gospel, and I refuse to partake of that supper. I refuse to worship God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, we're encouraged to, to 
to offer up offerings. That is the, the fruit of our lips, the praise to God. We do it in our songs. We do it in our prayers. We do it in our observance of the Lord's Supper. We praise God. We offer something. There's an illustration in the last chapter of of Second Kings, chapter and that's chapter 24, where David has come back and he is coming back into Jerusalem, and and a man sees David coming. He says, "Here's my altar. Here's my here's my threshing floor. You can have it. You can have it." Just take it. It's yours. It later became, as, as I understand, the, the place of the temple, but David didn't accept it as a gift. David was going to worship there. He was going to build an altar there. And he said, I will not offer to my Lord of that which costs me nothing. Do we offer God the second fruits of what we have? Do we offer God only if we feel like singing? Do we pray only if we feel like praying? Do we take the Lord's Supper only if we feel like partaking? Do we listen to the sermon only if the, the preacher is good and draws us in? Or only if we feel like being preached to today? Do we give only if we think we might have enough to give to God? And then finally, when I worship, I come away affected. That's A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Affected. Something has occurred. Now, it is not to be something that I manufacture. I do not believe that it's something that I manufacture or try to pull and say, this is why I'm here. This is, this is exactly. And if it's not there, I, I didn't get anything out of it. You realize that when Isaiah saw and worshipped God, he said, woe is to me, for I am an unclean, I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. He was affected, and he was affected in that he saw his inadequacy. When you stand before the master of the universe, or in our case, sit before the master of the universe, do you realize how great God is and how big God is? And how great a king Jesus is? And how small it is, the place where I sit, and how small I am? In the midst of that, I go to St. Louis at times, maybe to see a ball game, and, and on occasion I've, I've stood at the feet of the ark. You ever done that? If you have vertigo, it'll kind of affect you uh, in the opposite way. You look up and you kind of start getting dizzy seeing, seeing that thing soaring there. It's huge. When you're standing there under it. Have you ever gone to a, a ball game or anything else and just looked around, looked around and, and saw how many people? Sometimes last, last year when my dad was over at the Steely House and he would see a football game and see the 75,000 or the 100,000, he'd say, look at all those people. Look at all those people. It's amazing. But you stand, you sit before the, the God of the universe. Does it not affect you at all? At how big He is and how great He is and how great a King Jesus is? And how small you are. I often quote Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. which is, tells us we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Which means He does, and He is, and He can. Or we do, He does, He is, and He can. 
We have one who was tempted like we are, yet without sin. So we have a high priest that is much more effective and much more adequate than any high priest of the world. But notice verse 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and, and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, when I worship adequately, I see my inadequacy. But I also realize that because of Jesus Christ, I can have boldness to come to the throne of grace. I don't have to say, I don't belong in the assembly because I'm a sinner. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. But when I come to the throne of grace, I come as a redeemed sinner. As a beloved sinner. As someone who is inadequate in himself, but adequate because of Jesus. And so this morning I ask, or I begin, the statement, when I worship. Finish it with me in your mind. When I worship, I stand in a long line of worshipers. But am I adequate in worshiping God as He would have me to worship? Or am I just doing my own thing? When I worship God, I worship the, the Lord of the universe, not the person sitting by me, not the person standing in front of me, not the persons who are looking on the outside and judging me. I worship God. What so many people don't understand, when I worship, I offer something. I don't come as, as someone to be entertained or, in, or informed, per se. But I do come as one who gives everything I've got to God in one way or another. I come away affected. At polishing the pulpit this past week, there was a preacher who had been preaching for 55 years, I think he said. He said his goal, is, as, as a preacher especially, was, was to have people leave the building with these words, either on their tongue or in their hearts. I'm better now. I'm better now doesn't mean that that made me happy or that made me feel better. It's, I'm better now. You know, sometimes when I take, better, uh, take medicine that doesn't go down very well and it tastes bitter, it makes me better still. When I do something that the doctor tells me to do and I don't enjoy it, it still makes me better in spite of whether I like it or I don't like it. I could pray that what we have done has been acceptable to God, but we've already done it for the most part. I pray that our words this morning are falling on receptive ears. I pray that you'll think about what I've said. But most of all, I, I, I just pray that, that you'll be able to say the same things when I worship. I worship the Lord of the universe. I stand in a long line of worshipers, but I want to worship God acceptably in spirit and in truth. I offer something when I worship. And finally, because of my having been a part of God and His worship, I'm affected. If you're not a child of God this morning, the worship assembly may be something different to you and strange to you. We'd love to talk to you about our worship practices and about being acceptable to God before you return worship to Him. That is simply by obeying the Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which means that Jesus died for us, that He, he came to this world, that He gave Himself for us. He loved me and He gave Himself for me, Galatians 2, verse 20. That in return, 
He wants me to repent of my sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. That repentance only comes when I believe and confess that Jesus is indeed the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And I seal that. That's, that's my word. I bring about all of that together in one thing. As I come to Christ and, and as I obey Him, and I'm, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm buried with Christ, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And I rise to walk a new person, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It may be that some of the things that I've said this morning have engaged your heart as a Christian who knows that, that really when you think about your worship, you don't think about your worship. You just don't. Maybe your life has been such that it wasn't even affected. Isaiah was told, here, uh, who's going to sit, go for us? He said, here am I, send me. Are you willing to go forth as God's servant as a result of your worship together this morning? I hope you'll think about these questions. We have a song this morning that we're going to sing. Hopefully to encourage you to not only think about, but also engage in obeying Him. And if that would be your desire this morning, would you come as we stand and as we sing? And I will ever praise you, O oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you, I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And step by step, you will lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. you're part of our hospitality team, you may go to your doors at this time. <clears throat> holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy with all of my heart I sing, great heart, you Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great heart, you Lord, most holy.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your creation. We're so thankful for all the beauty that you have bestowed upon us. We're so thankful that we can come together and worship you. And so thankful that you give your Son for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray, dear Father, we always realize that all things come from you and that you will take care of us. We pray, dear Father, for those of our congregation that are sick. We pray that you'll comfort them and bring them back to their much wanted health and please our will. We're so thankful that we can worship you and we pray, dear Father, that we'll always want to worship you and put that first in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.